Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nigel Day Brown Davis. I'm an independent historian with an interest in black British history and colonial West African history. It's an honor to introduce to you today two distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Norma Gregory. Norma is an independent historian and journalist uh, with a particular interest in black British literary history. Uh, and she's also particularly focused in the Nottingham area, uh, black British literary history in Nottingham. Uh, she's just written a book entitled Jamaicans in Nottingham, Narratives and Reflections. It'll be out in two weeks if you purchase it soon. She's also had a significant role in the erection of the first blue plaque to an individual of African descent in Nottingham called George Africanus. She'll be presenting a paper today entitled Early Black British Narratives, Their Significance and Legacy. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Norma Gregory. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for having me um, today to do this. So, scholarly research into early narratives written or produced by Africans of the diaspora, also known as slave narratives in Western academia, seem to begin in the early 20th century, marking the start of the narrative's republication and preservation. In the 1930s, Frisk University, a historically black university founded in 1886 in Nashville, Tennessee, USA, and the US government jointly funded a scheme called the Federal Writers Project, which sets about interviewing former American slaves and recording hundreds of autobiographies for research purposes. Following this, the civil rights movement and pan-African movements in the US and Britain in the 1960s and early 1970s lit the spark for recovery, collation and revision of significant lost African texts and other important writings by people of African origin. Academic discussions continued throughout the 1970s, mainly in the US, through articles, books and dissertations, perpetuating the African narrative into becoming a unique literary genre. On the other hand, Britain in the early 1980s seemed to begin serious literary research into writings produced by Africans in Britain through the works of key black British historians and cultural theorists such as Peter Fryer, he was mentioned earlier and that's uh, essential reading if you're studying black British history, James Warvin, David Dabidine, Paul Gearoy, Helen Thomas, Paul Edwards, not forgetting distinguished scholars of African American literary history such as Henry Louis Gates Jr. Vincent Caretta and William, uh, William L. Andrews, among others, who have all contributed to our current knowledge of black literary history. There has also been a revision of scholarly interest in early African narratives in Germany, France, Japan, Latin America and the Caribbean. There are an estimated 6,000 plus narratives of African origin in archives, primarily in the US, Canada, Germany and the British Library in the UK, thought to be in existence with dozens written by former enslaved Africans and free African men and women residing in the UK at some point in their life journeys. Early narratives were sometimes published in newspapers, magazines, anthologies, court records, church documents and in US state and federal reports. Hundreds of thousands may, be, may, may still exist as all accounts, but sadly deemed as not valid or unlisted in many Western research institutions. Currently, there is no online archive or specific museum collection of early African autobiographical writings in Britain, an issue that I believe may, must be addressed in the future. I argue that an early narrative of the African diaspora is an autobiographical testimonial written representation of the life experience, experiences of an African person during and after the transatlantic slave, slavery period throughout the 16th to the 19th century. As a product of their age, these narratives give valuable and rare detailed personal accounts and to a degree in an African person's own words from their new worlds as former captives or free men and women in Europe and in, in the Americas. The majority of 18th century early African narratives were written and published primarily in London, UK or New England, North, North America as ironically these locations and centres of learning and commerce offered a relatively safe and humane place for protest and demand for freedom by Africans, particularly in, in England following the Somerset case of 1772. From this unique legal case, runaways and free black people have gained a degree of 
uh, of legal freedom in Britain had. However, with the advent of the American War of Independence from 1775 to 1783, public interest in the African narrative declined. The reality of the nation struggling for existence had begun and there was little interest in literature produced by outsiders in the US, such as Africans and other ethnic groups, as after the American War of Independence, there was a focus on rebuilding white America, re rebuilding a nation with the finances, resources and manpower gained through the business of slavery and other means. Thus, after 1807, with interest in the African narrative significantly in decline, and thus its first period of popularity ended, with the second phase in production and publication of early African authored narratives occurring from around 1830 to 1865. This time round, the key purpose of many of the texts was to expose and attack the institution of slavery. This phase saw the greatest number of African narratives published as a result of social socio-political developments worldwide, changes in economic policy and technological advances, cities were growing, the West and the US were opening frontiers, and with this, the formation of new societies. Greater optimism and social idealism began to materialize. In the 19th century, as decades passed and laws began to change, radicalism and insurrection increased through various methods. With more direct tax upon slavery and thus, more information was now included in these narratives concerning African people's contribution to American and British society. These narratives began to create greater social tensions as they were becoming more philosophical in approach. Africans were no longer enduring prolonged distances on slave ships, but were now born or becoming through law free African men and women in Britain, North America and South America and the Caribbean islands, where their forefathers had originally been enslaved through the transatlantic slave period and the European colonial expansion period from around the, fifth, the late 15th century onwards. Throughout the transatlantic slave trade period, most enslaved African men and women were not permitted or encouraged to write or read or write, so their life stories were written down by so-called sympathetic editors, women or European abolitionists. This begs the question as to how many of these narratives were edited out or simply rewritten, bearing in mind that many African writers would have been asked to submit evidence to back up claims made in their autobiographies. Many would have faced hours of interrogation and persecution. Also, there are questions to be raised concerning how many of these appointed editors made subtle improvements to the text over years, thus with new editions of the narrative deliberately making our reading of each text, text less pure and potentially less authentic. However, I believe many African narrators would have resisted these deconstructive edits to their life experiences. The richness in authentic and collective descriptions of life enslaved in some way ensured that the African narrative became a vital part of anti-slavery publications circulated in Britain between the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century, helping to galvanise public support for the abolition of slavery and demand for equality and justice. As a result, early African narratives became a powerful abolitionist tool documenting injustices and initiating political and social change. As the content from the earlier narratives developed over time, there is less mention regarding kidnapping into Western society, little or no mention of the Middle Passage sea journey. However, there is more description of attempts made to escape through the Underground Railroad, the escape route from the southern slaveholding states of North America and Canada, and the writer's experiences campaigning against slavery, as the African narrators, now first-generation Westerners, no longer have the experiences and memories of faraway homelands of Africa. The USA and the UK became their new homelands. However, many early African writers born or residing in the US or Britain now had to deal with the predicament of exclusion, discrimination and poverty within environments within which they were now native. The structure of these early African narratives was often written in a simple direct style in, in sections with the beginning, middle and end. They frequently began with an introduction in the opening pages, stating the title and assertion that the, the narrative was written by himself or herself, and often with an additional label of African, West Indian or fugitive slave. 
There was often chapters describing the narrator's childhood and life before capture, their kidnap from their families, their frequent transportation and displacement, whether across the Atlantic, from country to country, or from different plantation estates. Many early black, black British nar narratives had all the ingredients of a popular novel with personal interpretations of capture and kidnap, cruel enslavement, physical and sexual abuse, particularly the, women or the female authors, and separated families. There is often detail of a benefactor vouching the honesty and integrity of the author and the reasons why the editor published the narrative, usually inserted at the beginning or end of, of it. Each narrative was published with a minimum of two letters of reference from prominent respected citizens, usually ministers who certified the good character and authenticity of the story. Editors included prefaces, news clippings, copies of legal documents and other materials published with each narrative to ensure readers of their validity. There were obvious pros and cons to having an editor as he or she posed a mandatory compromise with the narrator's idea of form and content. Thus, an editor made serious effort to avoid unnecessarily antagonising the British stroke US reading audience. There was also pressures by publishers and editors and other sponsors to conform to tried and tested literary standards and formulas. In a typical narrative, there is often a, an omission of exact times and dates, with events usually placed in chronological order. The concept of time was often illustrated by descriptions of and refer, reference to local or national meteorological, social or political events, such as hurricanes, festivals and wars. Also, the passing of time was also expressed through references to changes in environment, quite often through travel, accidental access to print media such as newspapers and pamphlets, or through changes in personal circumstances such as marriage or a renewed sense of spirit and determination to survive. Through my research interest in early African narratives beginning in 2005 and a personal interest in the literary genre of autobiography as a whole since the 1990s, I discovered to my delight that several writers of early African narratives actually lived in Britain or travelled here at some point, in, some point in their lives. My research found that many African writers published their books or pamphlets in England, particularly in London. Many also travelled and lectured across various counties as part of their involvement in the anti-slavery movement. Some examples of early African narrators with links to Britain include... So I'll go through in a bit more detail now. Orlando Equiano. He lived in London behind Middlesex Hospital at 10 Union Street, now called West Riding Street, currently behind Oxford Street. Equiano was often at the anti-slavery office in London at 18 Alderm Aldermanbury Street. His life story called The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Orlando Equiano, Augustus Vaza, the African, was published in London in 1789. A first edition is currently held at the British Library in London. Um, Equiano sold his narrative himself with the support of various paid subscribers, including the radical publisher Joseph Johnson, whose shop was situated in St Paul's Churchyard, London. Equiano also visit, visited Nottingham, my hometown, in 1790. However, little is known of what he did um, whilst in Nottingham, so more research is needed there. And I was informed early, I did speak to um, our next speaker about that, so I know the answer. <laughs> Frederick Douglass um, lived in Britain for two years. He made no fewer than 51 speeches at 24 different locations across Britain in Bristol, Manchester, Ireland, Wales and Scotland. His narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave written by himself, was per first published in Boston, Massachusetts, USA, by the Anti-Slavery Office in 1845. John Jay lived and um, married um, in Portsmouth and preached in Liverpool, Manchester, Yorkshire, Limerick and Cork. His narrative, The Life, History and Unparalleled Suffering of John Jay, the African Preacher, was published in Portsea, Portsmouth, in 1815. A first edition of his book is held at the British Library. John Marrett was born a free, uh, to free black parents in New York in, on June 15, 1755. He became a church minister and was ordained in Bath, England in 1785 and ministered in the Huntingdonian Connection, a Calvinist branch of Methodism in Whitechapel, London, founded by the Countess of Huntingdon, and who was a keen supporter of John Marrett. <coughs> 
A narrative of the Lord's wonderful dealings with John Marriott, a black, was first published in 1785 at 40 Dorset Street, Spitalfields, in the East End of London. Marriott died in Islington on April 15, 1791, and was buried in the Huntingdon Chapel, now demolished in Church Street, Islington, London. Mary Prince, born into slavery in Bermuda in 1788, came to London in 1828 and visited Hatton Garden and Chancery Lane, taking shelter with the Moravian Church and Moravian missionaries in Fetter Lane, near Holborn in London. Mary Prince was helped by, anti by anti-slavery societies, founded in London in 1828 and in Birmingham. Her narrative, The History of Mary Prince, was published in Stationers Court, Hall Court near St Paul's Cathedral in London in 1831 and Edinburgh. Yukasaw Gronioso lived in London and attended the Tabernacle um, Church off Petticoat Lane near St Paul's, um, near Liverpool Street, London in 1772. He worked as a servant for Royal Artists Richard Causeway, a friend of British poet William Blake. His narrative was published in Bath in 1772 and called a narrative of the most remarkable particulars in the life of James Albert Yukasaw Gronioso, an African prince, and related by himself for copies held at the British Library. Harriet Jacobs completed her manuscript and sailed from New York to England in May 1858 and spent 10 months in the UK where she tried to sell her book. She lived in Liverpool, London and Steventon in Berkshire but returned to the US after 10 months. Her autobiography, Lives in the Life of a Slave Girl, was published under the pseudonym of Linda Brent in Boston, Massachusetts in 1861. Britton Hammond spent time in England at Greenwich Hospital around 1759 in London, recuperating from illness after being wounded in the head following a naval battle. He stayed in London before returning to work on merchant ships as a cook. His autobiography, Narrative of the Uncommon Suffering and Surprising Deliverance of Britain Hammond, a Negro Man, was published in Boston, USA, 1760. William Wells Brown became well known in intellectual circles in Europe, residing in the UK for several years. He gave an anti-slavery lecture in Manchester, which is recorded in the newspaper, the Manchester Examiner, and the Times on Saturday, August 5, 1854. His autobiography, a narrative of William Wells Brown, an American slave written by himself, had a portrait, has a portrait of Brown inside the cover. It was first published in Boston in 1847 and later by Charles Gilpin in Bishopsgate Street, near Liverpool Street in London in 1850. Incidentally, Charles Gilpin, a Quaker, publishes a total of 76 titles, including works by Elizabeth Fry and slave trade abolitionist Thomas Clarkson. Louis Assasa arrived in St. Ives, Cornwall, England, following um, severe weather conditions whilst on board a French ship and was taken with four of the shipmates to London. Whilst in England, he wrote his narrative in 1831 and was subsequently published in, in London and Edinburgh. Narrative of Louis Asa Asa, a captive um, Ameri African, is printed as a supplement in the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian uh, slave, a copy is held at the British Library. To conclude, this paper has argued that early black British narratives of the African diaspora, published, produced or written in Britain, are monumental literary accomplishments and significant cultural artefacts. Despite forced enslavement, enslavement, poverty, illiteracy, some and illiteracy, some former enslaved Africans, but many free black men and women in the UK wrote and published their life stories con containing extraordinary examples of courage, hope, feat, feats of heroism and strength of character, inspiring and motivating readers of the past and in the present interaction. These narratives illustrated individual action, determination, collective resilience, teaching us important lessons about tolerance, self-control and human rights. They are literary tools to help us ponder and reflect upon our society today. The texts were created by the process of self-liberation for many Africans bound up in servitude, yet initiated a force towards the emergence of a newly formed self and a stronger identity. Thus, early African narratives are a construction of cultural art, a regeneration and transformation process created from the wreckage of the past. They are a legacy to help us bridge knowledge and gaps in African literary history and African cultural representation, representation erased and excluded from the so-called canon of literatures written in English. They also provide us with valuable insights into a history from which the West often tries to hide 
helping us to understand who we are, where we've come from, our relationship with people of the African diaspora, as well as with people across the world. These African narrators found their sense of purpose by focusing on positive outcomes, on being survivors and focused less on the obstacles of life, such as prejudice, racism, discrimination and exclusion. Despite unspeakable suffering, early African narrators relied heavily upon their courage, intelligence, resilience and resourcefulness to attempt to raise families, maintain relationships and businesses, and surprisingly executed great control over their lives under the circumstances and legacies of the transatlantic slave trade. Early African narrators were the writers of their own, own history, and we are the products and legacy of their courage. These writers were active participants in trying to rid themselves of the brutal situations in which we have placed upon them. In other words, they refused to accept their situation. They took risks to improve their lives as many witness that the pen was indeed mightier than the sword. The authors of early black British narr narratives have shown their assertiveness, ability and strength of spirit through their production, productions of black experience through literature in an attempt to carve out a voice of their own and to ensure, as the late Dr. John Henry Clark, Professor of African History stated, that history can help to tell us where we are, but more importantly, what we can be. Thank you for listening. Thank you.